This video is to help you revise the cell and it's geared towards the Irish Leaving Cert Biology course. So the smallest unit of life is the cell. This basically means that the smallest living thing has to be made up of at least one cell. Take, for example, a bacterium. It's made up of one cell. Cells have three features. So they have cell membranes, they have genetic material, DNA, so deoxyribonucleic acid, and cells contain cytoplasm. So where do cells come from exactly? Well, cells have to come from other similar cells. So skin cells have to give rise to other new skin cells. And this is continuity of life. All cells come from other similar pre-existing cells. The microscope that you use in school is known as the compound light microscope. That's its proper name. And basically it gives you a good outline of the cell. It can magnify by up to about 400 times. And after that, you lose clarity or resolution. You need an electron microscope to see the detailed structure of the cell. The question that you're often asked is to calculate the magnification, the total magnification of your scope. So you look at the eyepiece lens first. That usually says multiply by 10. It's magnifying 10 times. Then you choose the objective lens that you're viewing through. So if you're using the high power lens, it will say multiply by 40 on it. So to calculate the total magnification, it's the eyepiece multiply by 10 and the objective lens multiply by 40, which gives you a total magnification of 400. So when we are looking at stains under the microscope, it's important that we get a good detailed picture. So stains are applied to the cells to make viewing easier. And you can see that the nucleus here takes up most of the stain. The cytoplasm does get stained too, but not as darkly as the nucleus. And this is a picture of cheek cells and cheek cells are animal cells and they've been stained with methylene blue. We did also look at plant cells, onion cells to be specific, but the stain for onion cells was iodine. What you're viewing under your light microscope is the protoplasm. It's the living content of the cell. It's the content surrounded by the plasma membrane. So it's everything inside that plasma membrane. These are the two classic pictures of the animal cell and the plant cell that you are presented with as viewed under a light microscope. When the cell is viewed using an electron microscope, you're getting a very detailed picture of the cell. This is the ultra structure of the cell, and this is the definition you need to know. It's the view of the cells you would see using an electron microscope. Electron microscopes can magnify by up to a million times, so you're getting a very detailed structure of that cell. There are two types. There's a scanning electron microscope, which gives you a detailed three-dimensional picture of the outside of the cell and then there's a transmission electron microscope which gives you a very detailed enhanced picture of the internal view of the cell. So when you do view your cells using your electron microscope, you get to view the organelles, these tiny little bundles that appear to be floating in the cytoplasm. They are cell components and they perform very specific functions. The two that feature the most frequently on your course are the mitochondrion on the left here, known as the powerhouse of the cell, because inside the mitochondrion, energy is going to be released from glucose molecules and that energy is going to fuel every single reaction in an organism. In the chloroplast, this is unique to plant cells and it's inside the chloroplast that photosynthesis takes place. The electron microscope has enabled us to see the detailed inside structure of cells and we now know that cells are classified as being either prokaryotic or eukaryotic. So what exactly does that mean? Prokaryotic simply means that the cell does not have a membrane bound nucleus and it does not have membrane bound organelles. So that means that the DNA is not in a nucleus, it's not enclosed in a membrane bound nucleus, it's in the centre of the cell and there are no membrane bound organelles such as mitochondria and chloroplasts. Then you have eukaryotic cells. These cells do have a true nucleus. They have a nucleus surrounded by a membrane and they do have membrane bound organelles. Examples would be animal, plant and fungal cells. They are all eukaryotic. So here you have a, a mushroom, that's a fungus. You have a daisy, which is a flower and you have a, a caterpillar, which is an animal. Each of those organisms are made up of many eukaryotic cells. Both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells contain these tiny organelles known as ribosomes. Ribosomes are not membrane bound, so they're not surrounded by a membrane. And that's why you find them in bacteria, bacteria being prokaryotic. The job or the function of ribosomes is to make proteins. And you'll actually find small ribosomes similar to the bacterium here in these two organelles, the mitochondria and the chloroplast. 
So this is a diagram, a very basic diagram of the ultra structure of an animal cell. And you can see all the key labels. See if you can spot the mitochondria and the ribosomes. What's new to you now in this diagram is the detail of the nucleus. So you can see the nucleus there and it controls the cell. But you can also see that there's a dark part at the center. This is called the nucleolus. And this is where ribosomes are made. Ribosomes make proteins. In the nucleus, it's where you find DNA, and DNA is usually found in this stringy form, chromatin. So when we look at the ultrastructure of plant cell, you're meeting many of the same labels. So you have the mitochondria there, you have the nucleus, you have the dark center, the nucleolus, you have the ribosomes, you have the cell membrane, but you also have these unique features. So you have that cell wall on the outside of the cell membrane. You have those unique organelles that are called chloroplasts and it's there that photosynthesis takes place and you also have this large permanent vacuole and it's filled with a liquid known as cell sap. This vacuole gives structure and support to the plant cell and is used also for storage. Plant cells are much stronger than animal cells and it's because they have that cell wall. That cell wall is made of cellulose. Cellulose is a polysaccharide and it's an important source of roughage and fibre in our diet. So now it's on to the structure of the cell membrane. The cell membrane has a very special structure. It's known as a phospholipid bilayer. So it's made up of two layers of these phospholipids. So let's take a look at a phospholipid. So a phospholipid has two parts. It has a hydrophilic head and it has a hydrophobic tail. The head likes water and the tail hates water. So phospholipids will always arrange themselves so that the heads are always touching water. That could be the outside of the cell or the inside of the cell and the tails are always neatly tucked away. And this is why it forms a bilayer. Embedded in this phospholipid bilayer are special proteins known as integral proteins and it's through these that large molecules, those too big to fit through the phospholipid bilayer, can pass to enter and leave the cell. For example, glucose. Other materials such as carbon dioxide, oxygen and water can just pass through the phospholipid bilayer. As well as the proteins, there are glycoproteins and these are involved in cell signalling or recognition. The model name used to describe the structure of the cell membrane is the fluid mosaic model. All the separate components, the phospholipids and those proteins, can move about within the structure. It's a fluid model. One of the most important things that you have to know about the cell membrane is its function. And it has a number of functions, the first of which is that it acts as a selectively permeable barrier. This means it controls what enters and leaves the cell. So some things, some molecules can move freely through the phospholipid, whereas others are tightly controlled. Two other functions or jobs that the cell membrane does is it plays a role in the recognition of molecules. So it's involved in recognizing molecules that touch it. And it also gives structure to the cell and separates the inside contents from the external environment. So it separates the inside of the cell from the outside. Often asked, where else in a cell would you find DNA apart from the nucleus? Well, in an animal cell, you would find DNA in the mitochondrion as well. And in a plant cell, you would find DNA in both the mitochondrion and in the chloroplast. Another question you're often asked is where else would you encounter a membrane other than the cell membrane and it has to be the nucleus. The nucleus has its own membrane called the nuclear membrane. Another question which you're often asked is to compare red blood cells to those cheek cells, those animal cells. Well, a red blood cell known as an erythrocyte has no nucleus and no mitochondria at maturity. These have been expelled. Red blood cells also contain many hemoglobin molecules and cheek cells do not. So that was a very basic run through on cells. I hope the video helped. Remember, you have to use your textbook, but most important, you have to do exam papers and check the official marking schemes. The very best of luck.